Oh, hey, Bob. Hey, here. Oh, Bob. Did you know you're going to hell? <laughs> this is from your aunt. It's the gift of salvation. Hey. Hey, ma'am. Do you want to go to the Lakers game on Sunday? You bet. That would be great. It's, uh, at my church. What? No. Is there a problem, officer? You can either go to jail or go to church. Your choice. Sinner! You should be in church. You are a horrible person. We've got an extra seat back here. Want to come? Is anybody in there? You want to go to church? What are you doing on Sunday? What's going on, TE? Hey, um, before we get started today, as you can probably tell, we are in a series called Back to the Basics, and we're going over four core values here at our church, which is serve, share, give, and grow. As you can tell, we're talking about share today. Hey, before we get started with that, um, you know, our pastors are out of town. They're in San Antonio. I just want to give some honor to our pastors. Can we give it up for our pastors real quick? Both Pastor Tim, Pastor Linda, I'm so honored to be on the stage. Hey, if you're watching with us today, uh, my name is Robert. I'm the youth pastor here. And so uh, we have amazing things going on with students all the time, including Paint War. I want to see all your middle school and high school students there this upcoming Wednesday down at Perkins Field. It's going to be incredible. But today I get the honor to talk about share. And I wanted to do it a little bit differently today. It's probably not going to be your typical, hey, invite people to church. But uh, I want to talk about some important things today. Before we get started, can we just bow our heads real quick? I want to pray over the message today. God, I'm praying that our hearts will be open, God, that we'd be receptive, that, God, you could teach us something today. God, that we would never think that we're too good to not be, to learn something new, to not go to a new level. So, God, I'm praying today as we talk about the share, God, that you would challenge our church and that, God, you would be in every word that's said today. God, we thank you. We pray it all in your name. Everybody said... Amen. So I told my wife earlier in the week, I said like, hey, I'm going to talk about one of my girlfriends from elementary. And she said, you're going to hear me in the rows going, boo, Bathsheba, Jezebel, right? She didn't say that stuff, but this is a church, so I can't talk about it. But so I wanted to talk to you about one of of my girlfriends when I was young, you know, elementary school, of course, my best player days, you know, walking around the playground strutting, you know, I'm just kidding. I was short, afro. I don't know what was happening with me. So but I, there was this girl that I liked, right? And Michael Jordan said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So I said, I got to shoot my shot. So what I did was, students, if you didn't know, back in the day, we had a thing called paper and pencil. And I wrote a note. And I said, will you go out with me? Yes, no, maybe. And the maybe's a joke, because come on, I'm a prize, right? So I sent it over to the classroom. It takes time, right? You got to make sure the teacher's not looking. It's got to get past people. Some people don't want to pass it. You have to threaten them. All that stuff finally gets over to her. She opens it up, no reaction, and, but it finally makes its way back to me. I open it up and it says, she circled yes, which, you know, I, I was like, oh my gosh, like I have a girlfriend. And then, you know, but I'm a guy. So on the outside, I had to keep it cool. I was like, that's what's up, girl. What's up? You know, I'll talk to you later. So I sent her another note, got her phone number. You know, after I got home, of course, I had to detox, watch a little bit of cartoons, some Dragon Ball Z. I had to have my time, okay? I need me time. So I get, I get home, get some me time, and then I call her. We talk, and I say, hey, meet me in front of the school tomorrow. After you get off the bus, I want to meet you before we go into school. So uh, we get to the school, um, and I say, hey, let's do something. Like, or let's, like, I, like, I'm so glad we're dating. It's so awkward because it's an elementary relationship. We have no context before you start dating. You're just like, oh, you're my girlfriend now. What's up? Who are your parents? I don't know anything about you. So um, I say, like, I, so, I, so I do something pretty bold. I grab her hand, and I say, let's hold hands into the school. Now, students, I have preached before that holding hands leads to babies, so I believe that. I still believe that. <laughs> Don't hold anybody's hands, okay? Parents in the room, you probably appreciate that, right? No touching until you're 35 years old, okay? So, so we, we hold hands and we walk into school and I see all the guys and they're like, yeah. I see all the girls and they're like, you could do a lot better, but cool for you. 
cool for you, you know? And that relationship lasted three days. But the most important thing was that as a guy, I got to show off my girl. And I got to turkey strut a little bit as guys do, puff my chest and be like, look at me. I'm not single anymore, losers. So all that stuff. But at the end of the day, everybody knew we were dating. I didn't have to say anything. I didn't have to post anything on Facebook. They could tell by our actions that we were dating. And what I wanted to talk about the share today is that simply based off how you act and what you do, not necessarily what you say, where, or repost on social media, can people tell that you're in a relationship with Jesus? It's so crucial. So today when we talk about the share, I want to talk about how is your walk? with the share. Because to me, that's the most important thing. If your walk isn't right, then the invite is never going to be what it needs to be, right? Your walk has to be right for that invite. And so um, I want to read you a scripture. I think it's really important for us today. It's found in Genesis 32. It's the story of Jacob wrestling with God in the Bible. And I want to read it with you, but it says, um, during the night, Jacob got up and looked or took his two wives, his two servant wives, his 11 sons and crossed the Jabbok River That's a big old family, okay? Sounds like they're from West Virginia. So this left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. And when the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He says, what is your name? The man asked. He said, he replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel. Because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. He said, why do you want to know my name? The man replied, then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel. It's probably not saying it right because I don't have a degree in Hebrew or anything. Which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face. He said, my life has been spared. The sun was rising. And this is the most important part of the verse. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel. And he was limping because of the injury to his hip. And I think this story really captures for a lot of us what's happened in our life, right? Like if you're new to church and God's never done anything in your life, nothing's ever happened, this might not apply to you. But if you've been in church at all and God's done anything in your life, is this not our story, right? God met us in a weird place. He wrestled with us because if you're anything like me, you fought God for the long time, right? I don't want to live your way. I don't want to do what you want. You're not right. I'm right, right? I'm smarter than you, God. And we fight with God. And then eventually we get to a place where we allow God to change our name, to change our story, to rewrite our history, right? And then God changes us. But the point of the encounter is how you leave it, not necessarily that you had it. And I think where we mess up with so many Christians is we have an encounter with God, but what happens after doesn't match what happened in the moment. You see, what happens when God changes your life is amazing. It's so awesome. But change is not an event. It's a process. And so what God now wants to do in your life is take you in a place where you are walking with him. Take you in a place where you are walking with God and does it show, right? Like that's the key to faith. Does it show? Does it show in every area of your life? Because here's what I've learned, okay? We're in America, right? Greatest country in the world. Back, back-to-back World War champs, take that. Poo-poo, right? <laughs> cool. But America spoiled us, right? Because here's the problem with America. It's not like other countries. In other countries, you actually have to, like, evangelize and do stuff. Everybody here knows who Jesus is. There's, it's nothing, there's nothing surprising about the fact that Jesus exists or that was around or that he went to the cross or that you wear it on a necklace or for everybody gets a cross tattoo for some reason for the first tattoo. And, you know, all that stuff. Like, Jesus isn't unknown in America. What the problem is is Christians. You see, because in other countries, like, it's easier to be a Christian in a sense because, like, you actually have to fight for your faith. Here it's just like, come to church when you can. Do what you can. It's convenient for you. And so what we do is we get really relaxed in our Christianity. And then what ends up happening is that the church is like, oh, my gosh, we want to grow. Oh, my gosh, we're doing an event. Oh, my gosh, all this stuff is happening. And they go like, okay, but why are you inviting me? You just cussed somebody out. I just saw you at the bar last night, right? Like all this stuff. And I'm not here to call anybody out. If that's on you, that's God, not me, okay? That's your fault, not mine, okay? But what I'm saying is, is that God has to affect our life so much that our walk matches our invitation. Here's, Here's what I thought about, okay? The greatest thing you can do to share Jesus isn't an invitation, it's imitation. You want to share Jesus? It's not about your invitation, it's about your imitation. 
See, because if you invite people but you're, but you're not imitating Christ or living like Christ or living like Jesus wants you to live, then your invitation is going to fall on deaf ears. So if you want to really grow the church, if you really want to fill the seats, if you really want to do all this stuff so more people can find hope, follow Jesus, and discover their purpose, then your walk has to match it. You know what I started to look at in the Bible? I started to think all, throughout all the Gospels, did you know that almost every single miracle that Jesus did in the Bible was never? So Jesus called people to him, and he fed them, and he did this. You know what it always was? It always starts with, as Jesus was walking... A man called out his name. As Jesus was walking, a woman grabbed the hem of his garment. As Jesus was walking, he found himself on the Sermon on the Mount. As Jesus, so you know what that tells me? God uses people in motion. So if you're not walking, maybe God's not using you for a reason. Why haven't I changed my school? Why haven't I changed my workplace? Why haven't I changed my family? Well, the question is, are you an example or are you just telling them they need to change? Because that just sounds like a Facebook post. Doesn't it? <laughs> All these sinners in this valley, but you ain't doing nothing. Your speech has, what is it? You got to walk the walk and talk the talk, right? That's so important these days. And so if you can, if you can walk with God, you can be used by him. So I want to challenge you, encourage you today, that as you want to be used by God, man, you got to walk with him. The invitation is only as powerful as the imitation that you have going on in your life. Because I, I, I want to, in my best way, act like Jesus. I want it in my best way. Here's the, problem. Here's the thing that I have to fight every day. What other people have done to people who hate Christians now. That's what I have to fight. I have to fight the people who are bashing students on TV or who are marching in protests and rallies and bashing people. Like, that's what I have to fight. I'm not fighting against flesh and blood sometimes. Sometimes it's spirits and principalities. But the truth is, is that we have dug ourselves in holes because we feel that it's our need to correct everything. Can I teach you something about faith? You are not the corrector. God is. Your job is to love people. You love people and God will change hearts. Don't think that you can change. Because the second you think that you can change a heart is the second you're going to lose somebody. It's your job simply to get people in a place like Peniel so people can have an encounter with God. That's the most important thing. So if you really want to share, if you really want to invite, if you really want to do all these things, start walking for God. Start walking with Jesus. Start walking the right way. Maybe get that limp back in your step. Maybe you lost it and you need to get it back, right? So I want to give you a couple things. There, there's a lot of ways that you could describe how Christians should walk, right? They should be empowered by the Holy Spirit. They should love people. They should pick up their cross daily. I'm not making fun of these scriptures. I'm saying there's thousands of scriptures out there to tell you how to live. But today I have the microphone and I get to preach. So guess what? There's only three that I want you to know. And this is what we're going to talk about, okay? So the first thing that I want you to do is never forget where you came from. You are jacked up. You're not better than anybody. Don't ever, so, don't ever get so intoxicated with your own scent, you forget what sheep smell like. That's good. You see, what happens is with Christians is we get on our pedestals. We get on our holy roller chairs, right? And we, what ends up happening is we just become the frozen chosen in the room. That's not what's supposed to happen. You see, you're not called to judge anybody. You're not called to do anything because you're already jacked up. So what, what I want you to understand, though, is that your story matters. Where you've been matters. Don't forget who you were or where you are. So many people, like, they, they get saved and they think they have to become this TBN person. They got to become this televangelist. You got to look like Stephen Furtick or you got to dress like this person. You know what you need to do? Just be you. God's called each and every one of us to reach different people. I can reach people that you can't reach and you can reach people that I can't reach. That's why with students we have a leadership team because I can't appeal to every student. But I do my best as the youth pastor to make sure I'm, I'm hanging out with all the students. I'm making sure that they're related to, they're getting prayed for, they're getting talked to, they're getting equipped and encouraged. But at the end of the day, we need everybody to make this happen. So don't think that you have to copy somebody else's safe. Just be you. Can I tell you something? Authenticity is way more attractive than theology. It really is. Now, do I want you to know the Bible? Absolutely. I want you to get in a life class. I want you to get in growth track. I want you to learn what God has for your life and what his word says. But you're not going to win somebody over by talking apologetics in a Walmart aisle, right? You're not going to get anybody saved in the, in the milk aisle saying, hey, have you heard that in Revelations there's a freaking dragon coming? Like, dude, this is awesome. And they're like, okay, you need to get out of Walmart, sir. 
please leave the premises, okay? Like, like that's not, that's not going to work. Just be authentic with people. Be real with people. Hey, it's a perfect place for imperfect people. Hey, I'm jacked up. If God could do it in my life, he could do it in your life. We'd be real with people. Don't make church some sacred religious thing instead of what it's supposed to be, which is a thriving, active community of people that are just real with each other, that share each other's burdens, that live amongst each other, that share needs and wealth and whatever it is. And we do this to grow people because you need community. Don't be fake. Be who you are. You're not better than anybody. Never think that. I never think that I'm better than anybody because I was there. And you know what's funny is that most of the things that you've gone through in your life, besides maybe things that people have done to you that you didn't deserve and it was never your fault, but most of the things that you've gone through, most of the mistakes that you made, you know what happens? God ends up sending people in your life that are going through the same thing. And you can say, hey, I've been there. Let me help you out. Hey, I used to have an anger issue. Let me help you out, right? Like I used to do this. Let me, let me help you out. So God's going to use your story. Don't forget who you are or where you've been, okay? Don't ever forget that. I don't want a church of people that are all puffed up and feel good about themselves. There's like a balance in faith. It's like a really tough balance of like understanding that you're not worth it and then being like, but I'm worth it, right? It's like a weird balance. It doesn't make any sense to me sometimes, but I'm like, I'm not worth anything, but God says I'm worth it. I'm just trying to balance my life out all the time, right? But I want us to remember that, that God said that he counts you worthy. So you get to live in that, but you gotta understand that we're all in the hospital. Some people are just in the ICU and some people are in general care. Some people are in the emergency room. Some people are in outpatient. Some people are in rehab because they're getting physical therapy. Like there's something, we're all in the hospital. So here's the other thing I want you to do. I want you to love people where they are, not where they could be. Here's what happens so many times with Christians. We, we, get, we don't want to evangelize or talk to people about Jesus simply because we don't think they're good enough yet. You have to love people where they are or else how could they ever get to where you think they could be? That's good. You, you love somebody for who they are, but you know what the problem is? A lot of your relationships, you try to love people off potential and that don't work. Yeah, come on. That's why marriage don't last. That's why things don't work because you try to marry people off potential. You can't marry somebody off potential, okay? Yeah. But in the, in the Christian world, in the Jesus world, we have to remember that we love people where they are. I tell students all the time, God loves you right where you are, not where you could be, not, not a version of your life where you're not having issues or you have a better family or if your family was like their family or if you had their struggles or their struggles didn't happen, whatever. God loves you right where you are. The Bible never says that God loves us once we've earned it. God says that he loves us and then the rest of our life is just trying to give him honor for what he's done for us. The rest of our life is the limp, right? That's the rest of our life. Why does Romans 12, 1 tell us that our life is a sacrifice to God. Why? Because you have nothing else to give but your life. So limp away. Act like the way that God wants you to act. And understand this. The hard part about loving people is that we can't love the way God does. It's impossible to be forgiving all the time, to never hold records of wrongs, to cast things as far as the east is from the west. Some of y'all have not forgiven somebody since elementary school. And if you saw that girl in public, you'd be like, she took my wristband up in third grade. I hate that girl. <laughs> right? You might start a fight right in the Ohio Valley Mall. You'd be like, you know what you did, Victoria, right? I know. But, but here's the problem, though. If we don't love people, 1 Corinthians 13, 1, we can put that up on the screen real fast so you guys can read it. It says, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So here's what happens. Hey, you should come to church, but all they hear is a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal simply because the love that you show for them does not match up with your invitation. So we have to be able to be real, love people, actually walk like Jesus so your invitation actually can be heard the way that God wants people to hear it. You have to remember that. We have to be able to love people no matter where they are in their life, no matter what their preferences are, no matter where their past is, what people have done to them, what's happened. I care less about all that because guess what? There is nobody that's going to go into heaven that's God's going to say, man, you did this perfect. All they do is say, well done, right? That's okay. I don't really care where you've been or what you've gone through. If you are waiting for people to fit, here, well, you know, here's the problem. That, this, is what I, this is what I want to preach on. Here's the problem. If you limit yourself to only accepting certain types of people, you are limiting your ability to reach more people. You will only reach Republican people like you. 
You'll only reach Democrat people like you. You'll only reach people that are super open-minded or super this or super closed-minded. And who thinks the government's doing everything and it's all a conspiracy, right? Which I'm, I'm part of that a little bit. I get it, okay? <laughs> but, but really, you're, you're limiting your scope. You know what Paul said? I become all things to all people. So you know why I don't, you know why on social media? Here's the thing about, here's the thing you have to realize about love too. Love also goes into digital backgrounds. What you post and what you repost and what you share and how you comment on people, that's real life too for people now. What did Mike Tyson say? People have forgotten that you can say stuff and still get punched in the face, okay? And I'm 100% agreeing with that. If you post something, I should be able to run up and be like, throw them hands, okay? Like, let's go. Like, but here's the problem. We have to realize that what we put on social media matters. I don't post things that, that are this way or this way or that way or this way. I don't share my opinions on social media. Guess what? Because I'm putting my opinions out there on public places that now create division. And the church is not divisive. Come on. And guess what, too? If you want to be biblical, the Bible says that we are to respect all authority. So if you're posting things about a president that you don't like, you're out of the will of God. Come on. You really are. You're supposed to be praying for your authority figures. Pray that God gives them wisdom. Pray that God does things. But don't be divisive in what you post. Don't just post random opinions that you have or share things because they sounded cool. You, you know, I had a professor once, and he said, he said, you know what? The sin isn't laughing at a joke. It's repeating it. Sometimes the thing that messes up what God wants to do in your life, you could read something and go, I kind of agree with that. But you don't have to tell people about it. Not everybody needs to know all of your opinions except your close people, Okay. Sometimes that's really important because that's what love does. Love is for all people. Love never creates division. Love it keeps no record of wrongs, right? Some of y'all heard it when you got married. And the preacher said all 1 Corinthians 13, right? Keeps no record of wrongs. Does all this. And you're like, well, I mean, there's some things I keep records of. But biblical love is inclusive and never exclusive. Inclusive, never exclusive. Don't ever exclude somebody from what God has for their life simply because they're not where you want them to be. Love them where they are. That's how you walk the way Jesus wanted you to. Here's the last one. You got to trust the process. It, here, here's what I mean by this. Did you know that if every miracle Jesus did was while he was walking, the average person walks three miles an hour, which means to tell me that miracles aren't very fast. So the people that God wants you to reach, the people that God wants you to do things in their life, it's not going to be quick. And the problem is, is we give up on people way too fast. Nobody gave up on you. Nobody stopped helping you. Why do you give up on them? Why do you quit in the middle? Oh, well, they're they're way worse than I was. Good. That means they needed way more than you did. You can't give up on people. You just stick with people. Jesus stuck with people. And you have to just realize that Maybe the reason you're getting all those jacked up people in your life is because God's like, that's who I want you to reach. And you're missing it because you have blinders on because they don't fit the model of what you think they should. Sometimes God puts people in your path because he wants you to step up. How would it have been if Jesus said, I'm sorry, I can't help no blind man today. Oh, I'm sorry, you're possessed by a demon, like a legion of demons, that's a little bit out of my stuff today. What would have happened if Jesus was selective with who he chose to give love to. I don't think the church would have ever existed the way it could. It would just exist for certain people. And that's not what we believe here at TE Church. We believe this is for everybody that walks in these doors. That you could be whatever you wanna be (laughs) and walk in these doors. And we're not gonna judge you. We're not gonna attack you. Now, and we're gonna say, hey, but it's not okay to stay that way. We will challenge you. Everybody that walks in here, I'll tell you right now, I may not agree with a lot of you but I love you right where you are. There might be things biblically that you think and biblically things that I think, and I may not be on the same page as you, but that doesn't mean that I can't treat you with respect and love and help you get to a place. And at the end of the day, just let God challenge you while I love on you and be just an example for you in any way that I can. Because here's the thing, what could happen if we did this? What could happen if our walk matched our talk? What could happen if the share now had weight and value simply because we as TE Church decided that we were done only acting one way inside these walls, but act how we were supposed to all the time, all the time, because God wants to do something in your life. God wants to use you. 
What did God say? Mark 6, 15, like 16, 15. Therefore, go into all the world and preach the gospel. What, Matthew 28, that go out that all men should be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? We're called to reach everybody in this world. And we end up missing a lot of people because we don't think it's our job. It is. It's our job. You're here for just a time as this. So walk the walk. Talk the talk. But don't miss that your invitation is so valuable. Don't, don't think that what I'm saying is, is that wait till you're good enough to invite people. It's not what I'm saying, but what I'm saying is, is that I want to make sure that your invitation allows you to see miracles that God's doing through you. So that's why I simply say invite, because our pastor says all the time that your invitation can lead to eternal destinations. It could lead to somebody's change of their life that they never saw coming. Your random invitation or random text or whatever it is or just seeing them in the store could be the thing that changes everything for them, that gets them in this place so God could do something in their life. But just make sure your walk matches your talk. The greatest thing you can do is not the invitation. It's the imitation of Jesus. That's what our world needs. That's what I've been praying about lately. That, God, I would act like the way you want me to act so I could reach the people that you want me to reach. And that, God, I would become all things to all people so that all students, all adults in our church, all people in the valley could know that there's a God who loves them that wants to change their life. And that if he could do it for me, he could do it for them. That's my calling in this world. That's my calling. And can I tell you this, too? So many of you, I, I think, you know, maybe not a lot of you, I know some people you would hate to be up here. But so many people, we think, man, I, I wish that I could preach. I wish that I could teach. I wish I could do this stuff. Can I tell you, the greatest sermon you'll ever preach is what you do off the stage. I, I work hard to make sure that I'm not just preaching lies up here. If, you, if any student's ever been in our youth ministry, I have loved everybody that's walked through the doors. I've never judged anybody, attacked anybody. I've never done anything. I have been as best I could to be the pastor that I've been called to be. And I think because of that, God's honored everything that I've done. And so for you, the miracle might be slow. It might be three miles an hour, but God's still gonna do stuff through you if you choose to let him use you the way he needs to. Let's bow our heads real fast. God, I'm praying for each and every person in this room. God, I'm praying for students. I'm praying for adults. God, I'm praying for, for fathers, for wives. God, I'm praying for sons, for daughters, for husbands, all this stuff. God, I am praying that God, no matter where we are in our life, no matter where we work, no matter what we're going through or what's happened in our life, God, I pray that we would just be used by you. That God, I pray that we would encounter people all the time that need to know who you are and what you've done for them, God. And maybe just fix the bad representation of what Christians have done that we have to fix. So God, I'm just praying that God, we as people of God, we as TE Church would say, God, I want my walk to match my talk. God, I wanna be an imitator. I wanna be a representation of Jesus. God, into the world so that way, God, more people can find hope, follow Jesus, and discover their purpose. God, I thank you for today. God, I pray that this challenges us, that, God, you use us today, God. And I pray that because of what you, what's been said here, God, because of what you're doing in our hearts right now, that, God, we will never be the same. And that, God, we will go all in. God, we thank you. We pray it all in your name. Everybody said amen. Thank you, church.